Welcome to our message for the third Sunday in Advent. Christmas is coming very clo um, cl closer. How many days to Christmas? Who knows? Not many. Uh, we've been looking at uh, Christmas according to the Gospel writers. We've looked at uh, Christmas according to Mark and John. Um, and today we're looking at Christmas according to the Gospel writer Luke. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, bless us as we listen to this message and as you speak to us through this message. Remind us of your great love for us, that we have a Saviour and that we can have peace with you as we trust in Jesus as our Saviour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, last couple of weeks, as I said, we've looked at uh, Mark's account of Christmas and John's account of Christmas. But they don't give us the how of Christmas. They focus on the who and why of Christmas. Uh, but uh, Luke in his gospel very much gives us the details of Christmas. Uh, the question, of course, is where does he get all these details from? Um, I like the suggestion that Greg Sheridan makes in his recent book, Christians, the Urgent Case for Jesus in Our World. Uh, Greg Sheridan is the foreign affairs editor for the Australian newspaper, a strong Christian, a Catholic, um, yeah, he, lots of things are great in his book. And he says, I like the idea that Mary briefed Luke directly, choosing him as the right reporter uh, to carry her story. And he says, of course, it reflects no less on her agency if she gave her story <coughs> to another trusted confidant who passed it on to Luke. And he goes on and says, um, Luke tells us that Mary thought uh, things through, pondered them deeply and held them in her heart. <clears throat> and uh, the Bible scholar Richard Borkham points out that in the ancient world, this generally means committing something firmly to memory. So it seems that Mary has committed all that happened to memory and either she has directly told Luke or someone that she passed it on to has told Luke. There's a picture of Mary there um, on the right next to Jesus. This is from the Chosen series, which you can get, download an app on your iPhone or your iPad or your phone or whatever. <laughs> or you can watch it on YouTube. It's great, I highly recommend it. Anyway, there's a picture of Mary and I like the depiction of Mary. Uh, she's depicted as a, a woman, of great faith, woman of faith and great character. Luke gives us the intimate details of everything. He tells us, for example, uh, how Mary got pregnant. And you might remember uh, she didn't get pregnant in the ordinary way, but God sent an angel to her and told her uh, that she was going to be pregnant with a special child. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you will give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, it's mind-blowing stuff. Uh, the angel Gabriel is telling Mary that she's going to give birth to the promised Messiah, the one that God promised uh, would come and usher in his kingdom. Uh, how does Mary respond to this news? Uh, well, wonderfully. She says to uh, the angel, I am the Lord's servant. May it be done to me as you have said. You know, um, Mary's no fool. She knows it won't be easy 
uh, agreeing to what God wants for her. After all, what will Joseph say, her fiancé, when he finds her pregnant? He discovers that she's pregnant. Uh, will he divorce her? Will he cast her aside? Or worse still, will she be stoned to death for being an adulteress, as the Old Testament law decreed? Um, it's a gutsy statement, this. I am the Lord's servant. May it be done to me as you have said. And Mary goes off uh, to uh, have the support of her cousin Elizabeth. She goes down to the hill country of Judea. Uh, Elizabeth is six months pregnant with John the Baptist and uh, she fills the baby inside her kick as uh, she sees Mary or as she fills Mary's uh, womb. And then Mary goes on and gives his, her song. I've never focused much on this song of Mary, uh, the Magnificat as it's called. I thought, oh yeah, um, uh, a song of the early church. But as I think about it, I, uh, these are words that almost certainly Mary herself wrote. Um, as she focused on the Old Testament and as she focused on what God had called her to do. Mary said, My heart praises the Lord. My soul is glad because of God my Saviour. He has remembered me, his lowly servant, and from now on all people will call me blessed because of the great things the mighty God has done for me. So we get the intimate details from Luke of how Mary got pregnant, how she responded, and we get the intimate details of the birth of Jesus, uh, the details that we use for our Christmas programs year in, year out. Only we don't tend to get it exactly as uh, Luke tells us. We're going to focus on the key words that Luke gives us. Uh, firstly, census. At, the time the America, at that time, the Emperor Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the Roman Empire. Everyone then went to register himself, each to his own town. And because uh, Joseph was of the lineage of David, King David, he went to the town of David, Bethlehem, uh, to register. And um, Luke's telling us too, in effect, uh, you know, the Old Testament in Micah, the prophet pro prophesies that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, not Nazareth. This is how come uh, the baby was born in Bethlehem. And we're told while they were there, while they were there in Bethlehem, the time came for her to have a baby. Ken Bailey, in his commentary on this, says, We can easily assume a few weeks, perhaps even a month or more. Thus the birth took place in shelter found by Joseph in those weeks. You know, in our nativity plays and whatever, Joseph and Mary arrive at Bethlehem uh, at dusk or whenever on the night that baby Jesus is born. But Luke's actually telling us while they were there, there's a period of time, and during that period of time, surely Luke, uh, surely Joseph would have found accommodation uh, with a relative uh, there in uh, Bethlehem. Manger is the next key word. Uh, Mary gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. You know, to, as I've pointed out to you here many times, in our Western thinking, we think of a manger being out in a stable out the back. But no, uh, in the Middle East, uh, animals were kept in an enclosure adjacent to the house, to the main room of the house. And the mangers were built into one end of that common living area. So uh, the baby is born and placed in one of these mangers. Why? Why place him there in, why is he born in the common area and placed in a manger like this? 
because there's no room for them in the inn or the guest room. They're both uh, translations for the Greek word kataluma, which is used there. I've got to show off my Greek. <laughs> but the word kataluma is used by Luke again later in his gospel with reference to the guest room, the upper room that the disciples are told to go to to prepare the Last Supper for Jesus. So almost certainly um, the translation guest room rather than in. Um, there's a picture of a guest room. Uh, what's Luke saying to us? Um, Luke saying to us that Mary and Joseph stay in the home of an unknown relative and his family in Bethlehem that they sleep on the floor of the main room of the house with the rest of the family because the guest room is already occupied, that it's here that Mary's child is born, presumably with the help of the women folk of the family, and they don't need a crib uh, because the soft bed of a manger is to adjacent to where Mary and Joseph lie. So Luke tells us all these intimate details how Mary got pregnant, how Mary responded, the birth of Jesus. And he tells us too about the visit of the shepherds. Um, remember, uh, an angel appears to the shepherds out into the fields and says, don't be afraid, I'm here with good news which will bring great joy to all the people. This very day in David's town, your saviour was born, Christ the Lord. Uh, the shepherds are first to hear um, outside of Mary and Joseph this wonderful news that God's promised Messiah has been born and he will save all people. How? Well, we find out later through his suffering and death on the cross. Um, and the shepherds are told that to go to Bethlehem and you will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. That's to be a sign to them that this is the promised Messiah. So they say, let's go off to, well, the, first of all, uh, remember there's a great choir of angels and they sing uh, to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom he is pleased. Anyway, they head off to Bethlehem and they find the baby uh, lying in a manger like we just described. They're coming in the back door uh, adjacent to where the animals are. Um, and we're given three reactions to all this. First, we t we're told all who uh, heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So you can imagine uh, the relatives and others in the house with Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, just being absolutely amazed that this child, uh, an angel has said, is the promised Messiah. Uh, we're told too, Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her, in her heart, which as we heard at the start, is a way of saying she remembered everything and she passed them on, passed this on uh, to others and probably to Luke himself. And we're told the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. Well, you would, wouldn't you? After such an incredible experience. Well, it's wonderful to hear all these intimate details about Christmas from Luke. Um, the question is, what does it all mean for us? Um, I think three main things from Luke's account. Firstly, we're reminded that God so loved us that he sent his beloved son into this world to show us how he feels about us. God didn't stay up there in eternity and say, let them go to it if they want to mess things up. No, he came down in the person of the Son and was born uh, as a tiny little baby for us, um, which shows us of God, God's great love for us. 
He became the man Jesus and through the man Jesus we hear and see um, the love of God and then Jesus went the road to the cross uh, to suffer and die for us. So as we look at the baby in the manger, uh, we're aware that, we're reminded that that's how much God loves you and me. And now all this is uh, important to us as we live out our lives because there are many times when we go through hardships and we think to ourselves, oh, God really doesn't care for me. Uh, he really doesn't love me. Uh, he's letting all this happen to me. At times like this, this Christmas and in the future, look at the baby in the manger and remember this is how much God loves me. Furthermore, um, well, as it says there in that slide, he will be called the Son of the Most High. Uh, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. That's who Jesus is and through Jesus we discover the heart of God. Secondly, we discover that Jesus is our saviour, our rescuer. What did the angel say to the shepherds? Um, don't be afraid. I'm here for good news for you shepherds, you uh, people that others regard as sinners, which will bring great joy to everyone. This very day in David's town, your saviour, your rescuer was born, Christ the Lord. You know, um, as I said, Jesus goes the way to the cross and he suffers and dies for us as the suffering servant of God, mentioned by Isaiah 53, and he suffers and dies for our sins, for your sins. And the third thing which relates to the second one is we can have peace as we respond positively positively to the good news of Jesus. You remember what the uh, great host of uh, the great choir of heaven's angels sang? Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those with whom he is pleased. In other words, peace to those who respond positively to the good news of Jesus. And that's wonderful stuff, you know to know you're at peace with God as you think about the crummy things you've done in life, the things that even now you might feel guilty and ashamed of. God says, my son suffered and died for all your sins. In the person of the son, I suffered and died for you. You're forgiven. Those are wiped away. Um, as Cory Tim Boom said, into the deepest realms of the ocean. They're gone. We can have peace with God. We can sleep at God at, uh, at night. We can live our life with a smile on our face because we are at peace with God. Let me finish up by wishing you a Christmas blessing. Um, I hope you see me again um, before Christmas, next Sunday and over Christmas, uh, same place <laughs> on YouTube. Uh, but this is a chance for me to give you, uh, to wish you Christmas blessings as you remember through the Christmas story that you are loved by God, that you have a saviour and that you have peace with God uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, may God be with you this Christmas and always. Amen.